speaker and the founder of the Headache Institute and the Head of Headache Center Fellowship, uh, Christina Trependall. Christina is a graduate of Vanderbilt University. She got her postgraduate degree from the Mississippi, uh, Mississippi University for Women. Um, she's currently working on her master's thesis in uh, headache disorders from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, which is where our keynote speaker runs the, um, the headache center there. Um, she has been chosen uh, to, among world-recognized experts to be a speaker in the 2020 um, Migraine World Summit, which is really a fantastic um, endeavor. Uh, she received her uh, Certificate of Added Qualification in Headache Medicine from the National Headache Foundation as one of the first NPs to do so in 2016. And she currently is involved in uh, multiple uh, clinical trials and has served as a principal investigator for more than 10 um, national and international uh, clinical trials in headache medicine. And because she's so quiet and soft-spoken, I did not even know that she was voted 2018 America's Top Nurse Practitioner because you're just such a quiet, <laughs> low-key, calm. calm, reserved. Um, but with that, I would like to welcome um, our founder, Christina Trependall. Thank you. I'm going to do a little skit this morning to make it more interesting. So um, hold on. And I have no acting degree. I'd probably be kicked out of acting school. But I'm going to have my, um, this is Natalie. She's going to play the patient, Natalie, who comes to see a headache provider. So um, in just a minute. Um, first, let me ask some questions. How many people in this room actually have um, a headache disorder or have headaches frequently? Now keep your hands up. How many of you um, have somebody who in their family, their brother, their sister, their mother, or their child has headaches? And how many of you, keep your hands up, how many of you, I'm trying to keep you all awake, how many of you um, have a close friend or coworker who has headaches? Okay, who doesn't have their hand up? Okay, so I'm just trying to point, you can put your hands down, I'm just trying to point out that this is a u ubiquitous problem, but I think it was the World Health Alliance um, uh, called migraine in 2006, the um, migraine is the forgotten epidemic. So everybody minimizes it. Oh, it's just a headache. Oh, she's just faking it. Oh, it's just a neurotic disorder of, um, disorder of neurotic women and who can't handle stress. But with the technology of the science that we have, we've got so much proof now that this is a real thing. We can see brain changes and functional MRIs, and there's a lots of chemistry going on and electrical changes in the brain. And that's really exciting, and that allows us to look for new therapies. But we're also trying to get rid of the stigma of migraine, the stigma that it's your fault, you can't handle stress, or you can't handle things. Um, so I'm going to just do the basic 101 of migraine, and then you're going to have experts speaking about every piece and portion. So I might breeze over something today because I know another speaker is going to cover it. Okay. So Natalie, welcome to the Headache Center. Don't trip. Thank you. Oh, and she's going to sit there. And this is her first patient appointment. I've never met Natalie. And if I put my hand up like this, she, she, she goes silent, and I get to talk to you guys, OK? So hi, Natalie. Hi. Nice to meet you. OK. So I, I know you just spent an hour with the tech, and she gave you, you gave her a lot of information. That's your past medical history. And you gave her your list of medications, and you gave her um, any surgeries you've had. I'm going to go in more detail about the headache part portion, okay? Okay. So, um, and I'm going to get down and dirty into um, where it hurts and all that later. But first, I want to know does anybody in your family have headaches? No? Nope. Mm -hmm, so. Mom or dad never complained about headaches? Not like, not like oh, they have. Oh, they're not like yours. No. So they have headaches. They're just not like hers. Okay? So a lot of people will say that their family does not have headaches because they think they didn't have the right kind of headaches. But, okay. Um, and Natalie, um, how old were you when you started having headaches? In my 20s. In your 20s? Well, migraines. I can remember headaches back to when I was starting the dance team. I remember that. I was about 10 years old. You were 10 years old? Okay. Yeah. So what's important is to not worry about when she got diagnosed or when she started having the bad headaches, but when the headache 
picture, the biology of the headache picture started coming out. Um, and before um, puberty, uh, migraine is more common in boys, but after puberty, it becomes more prevalent in women. So I'm going to ask a few more questions. Um, tell me, how's your sleep at night? Not very good. I mean, it depends on, you know, kind of the mm -hmm. night, I guess. But Do you go to sleep at the same time every night and have a regular schedule? I try to, um, but, you know, it depends on whether I have a headache or not. Okay. So. Um, let's talk about your headache. Um, where does your head headache, where usually is it in your head? Usually it's on my left side. Mm -hmm. um, starts lower in the, toward the back of my skull mm -hmm. and then it'll kind of, you know, make its way around here. It's mm -hmm. always on my left side. On your left side. Yeah. Okay. And um, is it ever pounding or throbbing? Yes. It's like a heartbeat. It's like a heartbeat. Okay. And then if, if um, zero is no pain and 10 is somebody's cutting off your arm, how bad can it get on the pain scale? Uh, a 10. A 10? Plus. Okay. Yeah. And um, what do you take for your headaches? What do you do for your headaches? How do you treat your headaches now? Usually I will wake up and take two Excedrin because I know it's coming. And then throughout the day, you know, a BC, mm -hmm. whatever can, you know, take it away, but it rebounds, so. Okay, so if I put you on a deserted island and you didn't have any medication, how long would your headache last? Days. Days, okay. Yeah. And um, how often are you having your headaches per week, say? Probably five out of seven days a week. Five out of seven days yeah. a week. And those other two days a week, you're completely pain-free, you don't have any headache? Um, I wouldn't say that. Okay, <laughs> so you're having more headaches than you, yeah. yes. Um, and what makes your headaches better? Really sleep in a dark room. Okay, and um, do you know anything that specifically triggers your headaches? Let's see, chocolate, um, red wine, if I work out too much, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of all over the map. Okay, and um, if, if you have your headache, and the bad headaches, the 10, and I asked you to do jumping jacks. Would you do that? Hell no. Okay. Don't cuss. Okay. And um, do you get any um, weird visual symptoms before your headache ever starts? Yeah, uh, kind of. I mean, I'm sensitive to light, so. Okay. All right. It but you makes me dizzy. But you don't have any um, visual things like you're missing your vision before the headache I ever starts. Blurred vision. Just blurred. Okay. All right. And that blurred vision is common with migraine, but that is not aura. So I just want to get straight that. And 90% of the people who have um, aura will complain of a visual um, disturbance, and they don't necessarily have to have their aura every time. Um, do you ever get um, numbness or tingling in, in any part of your body when you're getting migraine? I don't know if this is crazy, but sometimes I feel it in my left hand, mm -hmm. a little numbness. A little numbness? Yeah. Is that before? Like a little tingly. Is that the before the headache or? During the headache? It's or? usually leading up to the big ones. Leading up to the big ones. Yeah. So how long does that typically last? I don't know. Um, Will it be five minutes or longer? Ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. And then the, if you get that, you know the head pain's coming? Yes. Do you have any trouble getting your words out before a headache? I mean, I don't have trouble speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess there's some confusion, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes. But you, you've never have had jarbled words come out or anything like that. Okay. And then um, I'm going to ask a little bit, a few more questions about this. Um, do you ever have any nausea with your headaches? All the time. All the time? Do you vomit? Yes, violently. Okay. Um, and then do you have any sensitivity to light or noise? Yes. Um, light and loud noises. Yes, I have a toddler, so every move she makes. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, do you ever feel any like motor weakness, like you can't move a limb in your body when you have your migraine? Just that like weirdness with my right hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But um, no like paralysis or no, anything like no. that. Um, you ever get double vision where you see two of everything? Yeah, sorta. You know, okay. it kind of like it's dragging you a little mm -hmm. bit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then you get neck pain with your headaches? Neck pain. That's where it all started. Okay. So. Um, and then who did you see before you came to see us? My general doctor, and, you know, from my hometown, and he referred me here. 
Did he tell you what kind of headache you had? No, he said that they were most likely caused by stress, but my maternal grandmother had them, so he doesn't really know, you know, and of course I'm a teach yoga, so. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever had to go to the emergency room for yes. a headache? And um, have you ever, are you having any stress at home or at work? Yes, I have a toddler. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, let me make sure. The headaches that you're here for now, has there been any, any pattern change since the ones you've had, you know, years back? Mm -hmm. Is something different about these headaches? These are the worst. These are, it's mm -hmm. unlike, I'm not here for the little headaches, mm -hmm. you know, I've always had those. This is mm -hmm. the big. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just getting more frequent and more severe? Yes. All right. And just, just laying down or standing up straight, like your position? Laying um, down helps. Helps? Yeah. Okay. And sleeping. Yes. Okay. Um, do you have um, any anxiety or depression? I'm, I'm not really. I mean, I have a, maybe a little bit of anxiety. It says you're taking Prozac here. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's for my anxiety. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, let me see. Have you tried medicines that you take either daily or monthly to try to prevent your headaches? Um, they gave me Imitrex, but I'm allergic to it. It gave so, me chest pains. Yeah, that's not prevention, that's for attack. Okay. Have you ever taken something to prevent your headaches? Excedrin. No. Okay, Excedrin, yeah. okay. And w tell me about the Imitrex when you had your attacks. I thought, I thought I was having a heart attack, a lot of chest pains, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then I went to the emergency room and they said it was just a symptom that okay. people can react that way. So you don't usually take that anymore? No. Okay. And um, is there anything about your headaches that I have not asked you that you want to share with me right now? They're just horrible. They're and just I'd horrible. Like help. Well, that's great. Um, and how many different doctors did you go to before you came here? I don't even know how many. I okay. Can't, yeah, um, I was referred all around. All right. Well, what we're going to do is actually hold on. Oh, it's not in here. We're going to come up with a plan. Oh, you already have your plan. You yeah, it. they gave me this <laughs> at the front desk. So we're going to give you a plan. And we can't just give you one medication. We've got to make sure that you have diet and lifestyle, prevention, attack, all that. So um, what we're going to do is give you a plan and a lot of education. So with the education, we're, we're going to give you a handout like, what is migraine? Okay? okay. And that's what your diagnosis is, it's migraine, okay? Okay. And then um, you don't have to necessarily have a scan just because you have migraine, mm -hmm. but since you say you have an almost daily headache, I'm gonna order an MRI. But okay. I expect that to be completely normal. Okay. And then um, this is about triptans. I'm gonna give you a different triptan to see if that works without causing bad side effects, okay? So there's a lot of education in here, and when I leave the room, my um, office staff is going to come in and tell you all about the specific things all over this. Okay. So you will have a plan that you will know what to do um, when a headache starts pr to prevent headaches and also what to do if everything fails like and you feel like you have to go to the emergency room. Okay. So we'll have a plan for all that. And actually non-oral medications work better in migraine because the gut's not working. Okay. Okay. I did take this little round white pill. Oh, the little round white pill. The um, they said I had occipital something. Occipital and neuralgia. And I tried maybe it's Topamax. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. yeah? I was on that for quite a while. Oh. That didn't seem to help. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Okay, I forgot yeah. to mention that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Natalie. Thank you. <laughs> Here's your headache. Plan. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Treating a headache disorder is a lot more complicated than treating the flu or the cold or um, something that's an acute one-time thing. So in order to, um, in order to, I think it was Peter Goatsby that said this and he might have taken it from somebody else, but a great history is not given, a great history is taken. So you have to make sure that you're leading them down a path to try to put them in a box to diagnose them and we're gonna go into that. So what is the best treatment for migraine and how is it diagnosed? Diagnosis is key and I'll I'm going to be harping on that the whole time. So these are my disclosures. And we also have pharma support for this. And please, during the breaks and lunch, go um, introduce yourself to the pharma people. And we also have, um, if you get your uh, agenda signed by the pharma people, we're going to have a drawing on Sunday. 
And so I have a, a lot of objectives here. So we're going to go through the prevalence and the burden of migraine in the U.S. population. Heather already talk, talked about that, 39 million. And then we're going to look at common pitfalls in diagnosis and barriers to treatment. And then um, the diagnostic criteria. And that's very important because there's no um, biomarker, there's no blood test or MRI that can tell you whether or not you have migraine. So it's totally diagnosed on the history and the criteria. So that's very, very important. Um, we're going to discuss some principles for treatment and management, uh, comorbidities, triggers, lifestyle management. Um, I believe uh, Chris Gottschalk, he's going to be talking about some migraine myths and triggers. Triggers are his favorite. Um, migraine pathophysiology, that's my new favorite right now. Um, and the neuroanatomy and the neuroimaging courses will be brilliant for that. Uh, we're going to go over and over again. Has anybody ever said or, or heard or been diagnosed with vascular headaches? Okay, so th they used to call it vascular headaches in the old days. Then they realized it's not a, a, a disorder of blood vessels. It's not a cardiovascular disor disorder. It's a trigeminovascular disorder of the brain. So um, if somebody tells you they have vascular um, headaches, that just means they're using an old term, and you've got to get the diagnosis right and see if it's really migraine. Um, and then... We're going to look at um, treatment therapies that have the best level of evidence um, and for both prevention and attack and optimal treatment. And we're going to go over medication overuse headaches. So I believe um, Natalie up here was taking Excedrin five days a week. If you're taking any medication for attack more than two days a week, you could be at risk of getting into medication overuse headache. And um, our keynote speaker does a lot of studies on medication overuse headache, and we're doing some um, clinical trials um, in the U.S. with medication overuse headache. So the, 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 the idea is that you, at first you're taking a pill once a month for your headaches, but as it increases, you might be taking it twice a, a week, and that increases and increases, and then it's the medication that's causing the problem. It's a secondary headache caused by um, treatment of the primary headache disorder. And um, that's just through lack of education, because we're not doing a good enough job teaching our patients to not take um, Excedrin every day and Advil every day, and, or Lortab, heaven forbid. Um, and we're going to go into um, the new medications and devices that are out on the market, or I think one just got approved last week, and there's, there's more to come. And then uh, refractory migraine and treatment. This is one of my um, favorite things, is what to do when your headaches, um, medicine's not working. What, bless you what to do um, when you've taken um, your two doses of uh, triptan and your nausea medicine and your headaches still won't go away, or you've done this for three days in a row. A lot of our patients will call us and say, I've had this headache for two weeks, what can you do? I'm like, I wish you would have called me at day three. So um, we want to treat them earlier so they don't get into the um, central sensitization. So and Heather went over most of these bullet points, and we all are going to have these bullet points, so I'm not going to um, belabor them. Everybody. Um, in, in the country has, if you go down the neighborhood, every fourth house has somebody has migraine in there. So it's very prevalent. And um, the common misconception is that they have, um, they're misdiagnosed. Um, well, either they don't go to the doctor to get the diagnosis, and if they do go to the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the provider, they're getting a diagnosis of cervicogenic headache, because like Natalie said, it starts in my neck. So it must be a neck pathology, right? It must be some degenerative disc disease. Um, and then they're also misdiagnosed here, especially with sinus headache. Um, a lot of my speakers are all in, in um, Mississippi for the first time, and they're wondering why their nose is leaking, and they're sniffling. I said, welcome to our allergies. Yes, yes, take some Flonase. So 60% um, of the um, people who um, would fit the criteria for migraine uh, use over-the-counter medication. They don't even know. Like when I talk to somebody in a taxi car, they don't even know that there is real medicine that's not just for pain in general, but real medicine that's specifically for either migraine or cluster or hemicrania. So that's very important. Um, man, I've got a dry mouth. Hold on. 39% seek bed rest, but that means that the other 70%, but 60% does not. So. A lot of people say, well, I don't have migraine because I never go lay down. I, I push through. Well, a lot of people push through, but um, if, if you had a choice and that pain's bad enough, if you had a choice not to go to your son's game or unload the dishwasher or do the household chores or um, work, what would you do? 
So a lot of people push through and have chronic migraine at work every single day. And you're thinking, they can't have a headache every single day. They're showing up at work. But actually, the people who have chronic migraine actually show up more because they, they know they can't take those sick days because they have to save them for maybe um, when their child is sick or save them for something else. But they know they can't take that, those sick days, at least in this country. You can in other countries. So, um, and then the genetic risk, if you have like one parent with migraine, you have like um, uh, a 70, 40% uh, uh, risk of getting having migraine, the biology for migraine appear. If you have um, two um, parents with migraine, you have a 70 to 90% risk of getting migraine or, or having that, the, the DNA for that. And we are, they are looking every day for biomarkers to try to tell us who, who's, a, who's a migraine brain and who's not and why and what's different about their brain. So, um, and then there's tons of money spent each year not just, you know, everybody says the drugs are so expensive. The drugs are so expensive. There's evil drug companies. But actually the majority of all the medication, uh, the majority of all the money lost, 94% uh, is lost um, in indirect costs. So that's people not showing up work. So it's lost through the employers. And Tim Steiner is the brilliant one who's been proving that throughout the years. But it's, lo it's lost um, by people not showing up at work. And then do you know what presenteeism is? Presenteeism is when you go to work, but you're functioning at 50% or 75%. You're, you're trying to just be there, and it looked like you're working. Um, but that, that's where we lose lots of money. And it's the number one complaint in um, pediatrics. So this is the criteria, and this is important to memorize this. This is the most important, I'll, I might say that about six slides. This is the most important slide I have today, okay? And um, I believe Ree Moore might have been one of the founding people who um, came up with this criteria. Um, at least her, some of her partners did. So yes, Olison and some of the headache mafia guys, um, back in 1988, when I graduated from high school, they came out with the first criteria for migraine. These world leaders got together and they said, well, what do you have to have? And so this is everybody across the globe. And then they've revised it a couple of times. And so this is the International Classification of Headache Disorders 3. Um, you can look that up. You can find it on the internet. It's very easy to find. Um, but this is very, very important. So in your history, you, you want to say that they've had at least five attacks, OK? So if somebody's, like if you've got a kid and they've had two headaches, you're going to have to wait and see to get the diagnosis, OK? But, um, you can have a suspicion that maybe this is going to be migraine if mom has migraine and they sound like migraine, but you, you should have had five attacks in your lifetime, at least. Um, and then the headache has to last four to 72 hours. When I was asking Natalie about you know, how long her headaches last, so many people say, only an hour. I'm like, you're here for a headache that lasts an hour? They say, yeah, I'll take that BC and then it's gone. So you have to kind of get out, if you're on a deserted island, how long would that headache last? And this is just the typical four to 72 hours. But when somebody has chronic migraine or central sensitization or get into medication overuse headache, and then they can come, become daily. And then, so you only have to have two of, I'm not good with the pointer, two of this criteria up, front, up top, so unilateral. But only about 60 something percent will have unilateral headaches. And especially after they've been having headaches for so long, so many years, they, they might have just generalized pain all over the head because they're sensitized so much. Um, and the unilateral location, is, it's good to say, yeah, this might be migraine, but it never says, no, this is not migraine because she doesn't have a uni uni unilateral headache. Does that make sense? So just because somebody has a bilateral headache doesn't mean they don't have migraine. And then pulsating and quality. And a lot of times I'll say, does your headache ever pulse, is your headache ever pulsating? And they'll say, no, it throbs. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's different terminology. So, um, and it doesn't have to be throbbing. It can be feeling like a vice grip on your headache. It can feel like imploding, exploding. It can be in the back, at front, because we're going to learn all about where the nerves are. The um, occipital nerve comes out of the C2 nerve root, which um, connects to the trigeminal nerve at the um, trigeminal nucleus called Alice. Really exciting stuff we've got. And basically, so the headache does not have to be um, pulsating. It can be any kind of pain, except for I mean, some people, you know, migraineurs also can have stabbing pain as well. Um, and then 
the ones that I like the most for me is it's aggravated by um, activity or if you say you've got your, your eight out of 10 headache and I asked you if you would run up the stairs, most people would say no or do the jumping jacks, okay? But if you don't ask that question that way, a lot of times you say, do you avoid activity? No, I plow through, I plow through. I, I do everything that's expected of me. And then um, uh, moderate to severe intensity. So moderate to severe intensity, if they come to you, if they've left work, made an appointment, scheduled an appointment, because we're not seeing people like ER, first and worst headache, and then they're taking time out from work, usually they probably have a significant pain burden. So um, a, you know, a lot of times maybe men will minimize their headaches. A lot of men will tell me, oh, it never gets above a five. And I'm like, well, can you go to work when it's a five? And they'll be like, no. So you, you've got to kind of measure it. It could be mild, moderate, severe. It can be zero is no pain and 10 somebody's cutting off your arm. But you, you really got to ask these questions and not just read, read this off, but ask it in many different ways. Some people will tell me light and noise doesn't bother them. I say, well, so if um, you're having your nine out of 10 headache, and my son plays the tuba right next to you, it's not gonna make the, um, the headache worse, and they, they change their mind. So, and then always re-ask the history. Another thing is before I go into a room or before my nurse practitioners go into a room, we have somebody who's taken the history and pushing all those little buttons on the template for the HPI. But I go back and, and we verify everything. Because sometimes they'll tell her it was on their left side and, some, and I go in and now it's on the right. So, you know, you just have to verify, and, and a lot of times we have to re-ask the questions and make sure we have the right diagnosis all the time, especially if they're not responding to things. Does that make sense? So, um, you can believe that you have the diagnosis, but if, if the treatment you're offering, it, they're not improving, you always have to revisit. Is the diagnosis correct? Is the diagnosis, maybe there's got something else that I'm missing. And then, um, nausea, a lot of people will say, 70% um, will report nausea with some of their severe headaches, but not everybody has nausea. And some people will say, no, I just can't eat. So any kind of GI where you just, no, I'm just not hungry. Now, there are people who actually eat when they've got a migraine because they say the, skipping the meal is what caused the migraine. So, um, and then only about 29% actually vomit with their attacks and they don't vomit with all their attacks. So, um, like I knew a nurse and this nurse told me that she worked in the emergency room and this pressure sinus thing that she had that would come and last for three days when it was gray weather outside, pressure sinus thing that she didn't call pain, she said it was not migraine because in the ER, those people had to be in a dark room and they were vomiting. But you, you see, we can have different characteristics amongst us and everybody is different from this migranor to that migranor and then within that own individual, they can have attacks that have different features at different times. Does that make sense? Okay. And then this just means that you've ruled out red, red flags. And I'm gonna go into red flags a little bit too. So, and then this is migraine with aura. Um, and basically, you only have to have a history of having two of these attacks. Um, and basically, visual, sensory, and um, speech and language if you have any motor symptoms, like if you have like paralysis or true double vision, those would um, indicate something like hemiplegic migraine or brainstem um, migraine, and you'd want to really get that diagnosis right. So the, like um, in my video, so what happens with when aura happens is that they've got this cortical spreading depression, which is like an electrical excitation. Um, with sodium channels and everything, calcium channels, where everything is um, uh, marching uh, um, across the cortex at a rate of, I think, three millimeters per minute or something like that. And what happens is first it affects the visual cortex, which is back here. And then as it goes further, it aff affects the, um, the sensory cortex. And typically it's, um, uh, it's only unilateral. And typically they'll say, you know, their hand goes numb and then it may go up to their face. A lot of people do not ever have those. And then the speech and language. Um, there was a news reporter named Serene Branson, and I always show this to my patients because the patients like to see somebody who fits that, you know, somebody says they have that, then I want to show them. So Serene Branson, she was a news reporter, and she was allegedly speaking in English, but when she went to talk, it came out in like Dutch. And she d didn't know Dutch, and they had to get her off. They said she'd had a, a stroke or some, something bad, but. She didn't have a stroke, she just um, had 
plain, typical migraine with aura. But a lot of people will get confused. You just, you, you want to make sure you get these boxes right because if you have somebody who has um, 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 paralysis and you've ruled out all the bad stuff, you still have to treat those a little bit different than you do somebody who has typical migraine with aura. So there's some contraindications. Okay, and then retinal symptoms. Also, um, complete um, monocular um, vision loss is always a bad thing. <laughs> so you always want to um, rule out um, a, a hemorrhage and um, get them to treatment immediately. So people should not lose their vision completely out of one eye ever without a fur further investigation. That can be like a dangerous sign. And then chronic migraines. So then this came about after they had the diagnosis. They, I think this has had like 20 different terms. It's been transformed migraine, mixed migraine, um, uh, refractory migraine. But basically they found out that some people only had a migraine once a year and some people had a migraine almost every single day of the week. So if you have 15 or more headache days per, per month, but you have to have this of at least three months. This has to be over three months. So you can't come up to me and say this headache I've had it for 15 days, I have chronic migraine. So it, it doesn't work that way. You, this has to be a longer history. And then eight of those days should fit the criteria for migraine, meaning either you took a trip tan or you called in sick at work or it had some nausea or it had some photophobia with it. And then this is the cheat from um, Dr. Richard Lipton. Um, if you were in an emergency room, I'm not sure where everybody practices, but we will ask. If you were in an emergency room or in a busy, busy clinic and you had to get people in and out in five minutes, this would be your best way to try to diagnose migraine um, if you ruled out the red flags. And basically, in the past three months, with any of your headaches, have you had any nausea or disability or even if you presenteeism and then photophobia. So if you have two out of these, you have a 93% chance of having migraine. This comes from the AMPP study. And then if you have three out of those, then you have about a 98% chance. So, um, but you can't say somebody truly has migraine until you pull out the full diagnostic criteria. So you, you're not 100% sure unless you actually do the full criteria. So it's very important to do the, the criteria. All right, and these are some triggers. And um, there's a lot of misconceptions about triggers. We're getting a lot of data that's coming out right now about prodrome. And prodrome, it can happen from hours to days before the headache or pain ever starts. So it can be hours to days. So if it's like two days before you even get a headache, there's something going on in biology, and we're studying that right now. It's very, very interesting to see what's going on in the brain. So prodromal symptoms, people can feel, um, they can feel like Superman, or they can feel exhausted, or they can have increased urination, yawning, um, mental confusion. So a lot of times, there's misconceptions, and I think Chris is going to point out this, that chocolate causes my headaches. Well, no, it might have been that your prodromal symptoms made you crave chocolate, and then you ate chocolate, and then your head pain came. Does that make sense? Okay, and Chris is really good at explaining that. But um, the top, top ones that I see are either <coughs> menstrual migraine, um, and menstrual migraine is when women have their um, migraines related to their cycle. And those are actually the toughest ones to treat. Um, I'll put somebody on prevention for migraine, and they'll tell me that it gets rid of all their other headaches, but those seven days are just awful. And they're, they're usually refractory to treatment, meaning they don't re respond well to prevention, and they might resp respond to today's attack medicine, but they keep on coming back the next day and the next day and the next day, and they're more severe. And then um, uh, stress, but who in this room can get rid of all their stress? Right? Um, so that's where biobehavioral um, um, therapy is very good. And so none of our pills or injections or devices work as well as those plus lifestyle education and um, biofeedback and the biobehavioral cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and then th this neck pain right here, neck pain and muscle tension. Uh, so many people come to me saying that they have cervicogenic headache because they, they pointed to the neck. Another thing is some people only have migraine. I have some patients who only have migraine in their jaw, in their TMJ area. And they can be pain-free for months. When it comes, it feels like they have some sort of horrible dental pain. And then 
I can treat them with a tryptan and it goes away. So there is such a, that's part of your trigeminal nerve. You can have it anywhere in the head, face, or neck can be the pain. And then cer certain people um, will do food elimination diets. I've never found one perfect thing that if everybody eliminated it, um, everybody would be headache free. But if I don't want to see a patient back, I put them on a gluten-free diet for three months. <laughs> Um, and then I was going through this. This is the phases of aura. There's actually a better one, and I didn't have a chance to find it. So migraine has actually five phases. This is missing a phase. Does anybody know what phase it's missing? No, Frank, you can't answer. Um, okay, so the prodrome, I said it can last hours to days. Um, and, you know, if you're not cognizant that there's a prodrome to your headaches, you, you might just feel like you're an ordinary person. So you might not be aware, because we're not educating the, pa the patients on this. They're not getting to us. They're not getting the proper diagnosis. So they're probably not reading this. So they're probably not aware of the changes going in on in their own body. So we're looking at the prodrome part of migraine and looking at therapies to treat during that time before you ever get the headache. Wouldn't that be neat? And then um, the aura, like I said, not everybody has aura. And um, just... Uh, a lot of patients will know their aura migraines or headaches are different than their other headaches. Um, and then the headache phase, like I said, it could be anything. It, you get throbbing, drilling, ice pick in the head, burning, nausea, vomiting, giddiness, um, uh, trouble concentrating, very sensitive. We, we, um, we were saying that migraine um, brains were different um, because they were overly sensitive. And now we try to say they have an enhanced brain, an enhanced neurologic system that can get tripped off very easily. So it's enhanced. And then the post drum, a lot of patients, the post drum is the pain is gone, but you feel like either a mat truck just ran over you or you feel like you have the flu. And that can last for um, a whole day or so. And some people will tell me that the prodrome is worse than the headache itself because they still can't function during their prodrome. Now, no headache specialists. Does anybody know what the fifth phase is that's missing? That's close. I know where you're going with this. You're close. So it's the interictal phase, meaning you don't have your migraines. So you have three days of migraine, you got your post drum, and then the interictal phase between attacks, you can have um, cutaneous allodynia, where you're kind of sore all over still. You can have um, nausea, is pretty common, especially if you have like chronic migraine, and cephalgophobia. I love that word. So cephalgophobia is an anxiety worrying about when's that next attack going to come. Because unlike cluster headache, they, they've got theirs on schedule. But migraine, you don't know when it's going to come. You know? And a lot of times, it doesn't come until the weekend when you can relax. Some people get post-stress release headache where they, they can work from Monday through Friday and conquer the world and be a great you know, CEO or a lawyer. And they come home, and they, they get the migraine for three days. Yeah, and a lot of people um, worry, they, they come to me and they say, my daughter's getting married, this is a very stressful time, and then I'm stressed that I'll, I'll be having a migraine in the middle of the wedding. So there's a lot of um, uh, fear and anxiety that goes along with the chronic pain issues. Anyway, I went through those. And, okay, another thing in, um, Remore, do they have sinus headache in Denmark? Okay. <laughs> well, sinus. So Ann Calhoun told me that. Um, okay. Ann Cal Calhoun, Calhoun. She's one of my mentors in headaches. She does, does a lot of. Um, she's retired now, so she couldn't come today. But Ann Calhoun, uh, I spent a week with her, and she, uh, a patient said, "I have sinus headache." She's like, "Oh, that's just the street term for migraine." So basically, to have real sinus headache. You have to have like an infection, an inflammation, a positive CT, or a fever. You don't have, now people get confused because they will, the weather will change, then they'll get congestion in their nose, pressure, maybe a little throbbing. They take a decongestant and some Advil and it gets a little bit better, but it really never gets better until the sun comes back out. So people have this misconception that they have sinus headache which is not a real thing. So you can have nasal, nasal pressure, um, rhinitis, um, so your nose can run. Everybody's nose should be running today because of those um, allergies out there. Um, and then um, congestion. 
And we're going to show a video, I think Jay has it, it's coming up soon, that shows that when the trigeminovascular system is activated, um, the, the blood vessels get en engorged and um, uh, the excitatory um, neurons come out, and that causes your turbinates in your nose to swell. And, it's, and they've actually done studies that if you give somebody whose turbinates are swollen, who's having a migraine, if you give that person an Imitrex injection or a Sumatriptan or something that's migraine specific, the nasal passages go back to normal. So that's pretty neat. And then, um, yeah, in a retrospective chart review, um, patients who fit the criteria for migraine, who had the diagnosis of migraine, 50% of them had at least one ocular or nasal symptom, okay? So just be careful for that and, and look for that. So 88% um, of the patients were misdiagnosed. 80% 80, 80 were misdiagnosed, and um, the, uh, the other 8% were probable migraine. So uh, if they get the di diagnosis of sinus headache, what's going to be the problem? They take an antibiotic and the migraine goes away and they think they got better. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to overuse antibiotics and steroids. Don't you want your steroids with your antibiotics? No. Okay. So people say, I just go to the, the, um, the um, MEA and get a steroid shot and an antibiotic and it goes away. And I do that once a month. And um, also, if you, if you don't have the correct diagnosis, you're not going to get access to the right treatment. Who's going to prescribe migraine medicine to somebody who has sinus headache? So you really got to get the diagnosis. All right. Do you have that video? So I like um, 3D stuff. That's why we have the neuroanatomy course coming. But I love this video. It's a great video. I can get you the, this is on YouTube. But we're going to show the, um, yeah, you can go. This is the trigeminal nerve. And neck area. The major nerve that does this is the trigeminal nerve. This nerve has three divisions or branches. The first branch, the ophthalmic branch, goes to the forehead and perhaps most importantly in migraines to the blood vessels and surfaces that surround the brain itself. The second branch is called the maxillary branch. This goes to the middle part of the face and very importantly inside the sinus cavities. The third branch is called the mandibular branch. This goes to the lower jaws and the muscles you chew with, including the temple muscles on the side of the head. All three of these branches can contribute to the symptoms of migraine. During migraine, the first division becomes activated and releases a series of chemicals that Anybody cause the blood vessels chemicals? in and around the brain to swell and become inflamed. The threshold for information to be sent along the divisions of the trigeminal nerve is lowered. When the blood vessels are inflamed and the head is moved or a blood vessel is stretched, the beating of the heart will activate and send a volley of pain information along the trigeminal nerve tracts and into the brain itself. This relay station in the lower part of the brain normally blocks out much of the extraneous information. However, during an attack of migraine, this filtering ability is impaired and more information is allowed to get through the filter and into our conscious awareness. As I said a minute ago, all three of the branches of the trigeminal nerve can contribute to the symptoms we see during migraine. This is the part I like. If there is an activation of the blood vessels and nerves of the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, the tissues of the sinuses can swell and other nerves can be activated that cause a clear discharge. This commonly leads people to believe they are having sinus headache or a sinus problem when, in fact, it is part of migraine. Okay, Jay, you can turn, turn it off now. Thank you. The third important source of information. So, neck pain, I've, I've gone over that several times. We'll be talking about the trigeminal um, vascular system and the, the TNCC, which is the trigeminal um, cervical complex and the trigeminal nucleus called Alice. So that is in the brainstem where everything meets. And, um, and then it can go up the brainstem through the um, sensory gateways like the supersalivatory nucleus to the, through the thalamus. And then it can tell the brain, keep on signaling more pain. So that's what we call central sensitization. So we want to cut that off before we ever get to central sensitization. Before, when, it's, when your pain is in the peripheral, at the very beginning, it's in the peripheral nervous system, not in the central nervous system. So you want to cut off the attack as soon as possible, or better yet, prevent it. So a lot of people with um, 
migraine report, um, neck pain and stiffness. A lot of people say it starts in their neck. Um, we do have people who have neck pathology, and we will say, we all ask them, do you have neck pain when you're not having a headache? And if they're not, if typically, if they're not chronic migraine and these are episodic, they typically do not have the neck pain um, at another time, I mean, without the headaches. Um, and then sleep disturbances. This is pretty huge. Um, um, Mississippi is the most obese state in the nation, and so patients of ours who have um, a BMI greater than 30 and um, chronic daily headaches, we make sure we um, rule out sleep apnea for them. So we'll send them for a sleep study. And then anxiety and depression. Um, and it's not, it's, they've looked into it about the relationship, whether or not migraine causes anxiety or anxiety causes migraine. It's just that they're comorbid conditions. Um, and so learning mechanisms to handle and deal with and cope with stress and setting a good schedule, going to sleep at the same time every night and not staying up too late and um, all that. The, the better handle people can get on managing their triggers and managing their, um, their uh, ante anticipating when something might be causing a migraine and avoiding certain things. Um, but Chris will tell you the opposite. Okay. <laughs> um, and obesity, also if somebody's um, obese in, Missis in Mississippi with a BMI greater than 30, and um, Regmore is going to go into this, um, they can uh, have, in if, that, if it's a daily headache, they can have increased intracranial pressure. So um, we, we, we look in their eyes at the office, but I'm not the best neuro-ophthalmologist on the planet yet. And then, so we send them to an ophthalmologist, not an optometrist, but an ophthalmologist to make sure that their optic nerve is not swollen, that they don't have papilledema. And then restless leg syndrome, there's, um, an, there is a guy coming tomorrow who's gonna be talking about stroke and TIA and how can you tell if it's a migraine with aura or a stroke or TIA, and epilepsy is common. All right, so the m first thing you wanna do is rule out a secondary headache so they, they, they don't, die. So once you know that they're not going to die of this headache, and um, like the, the, the worst I think is the first and worst headache of my life is somebody has a thunderclap headache, they have no his, headache, headache history, they, they need to go to the ER, okay, to rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then you're going to, well, if you've ruled out, oh, the scans look okay, oh, uh, it's not this, she fits all the criteria for this diagnosis, um, then you can get the primary headache syndrome. So there, there's actually more other, um, other headache disorders besides migraine. There's tension type headache, um, and then there's um, the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, which is a whole umbrella of unilateral headaches that cause autonomic symptoms. So you wanna make sure you get that right. And one of the key features to diagnose cluster, because sometimes cluster and migraine can trick you and fool you, and you, you're not sure if you're getting the right, right um, animals. So, Cluster headache typically, now th there's always the outliers, but cluster headache typically never lasts more than three hours. Uh, migraine has to last a minimum of four hours. So timing is really key. That's why your, your history is so important, really getting that history. And, and our patients, they're not doing this in a scientific experiment at home, so they probably don't even have a little monitor that says your headache's been going on for three hours now. So a lot of times they're not good at telling you the history. So, and um, a, a, a little difference between cluster and um, migraine is cluster's only gonna be unilateral. There is no such thing as a bilateral cluster headache. Now, sometimes it can switch sides in different um, episodes, um, but it's a, a unilateral headache. And anybody that um, I have that has a unilateral headache that never moves to the other side, and it's either severe or daily, we make sure we get a scan of those patients as well. MRI, not a um, CT. And um, then you come up with a plan. I was come up with a diet and lifestyle plan for Natalie and then prevention and education and, pre and attack and how to take this. And they, sometimes they say, I don't want to take three medicines. I said, well, your Excedrin has three medicines in it. So, um, and then reviewing and going over it. So a lot of our patients who come to us in a headache center will say, it's like I went to headache university because they learn so much. And the more knowledge that we give them, the more bag of knowledge or website, the more we give them, the better they are at managing that next attack. So 
I try to equip, equip them with everything they would ever need because I'm not on call nights, holidays, and weekends. And, and uh, I want them, if they're three hours away and they're getting the worst bad migraine at 2 a.m., but it's not like a, a red flag headache, I want them to have an injectable form of sumatriptan or an injectable DHE or a nasal DHE or a nasal Zomig. I want them to have something where they can treat with a combination of medications to stay out of the emergency room. The emergency room is the worst part place to go if you have migraine because it has bright lights and if you're not dying, you're last. And um, it's not usually quiet too. All right, I'm gonna rush through these. So, so these are the things that you have to rule out and it, in Denmark they do it a little bit different. So, but it's really the same. So in, in Denmark, don't you have a lot more O's? Okay, so yeah, um, this is SNOOP5. This came from Dr. David Dodick. But basically, if you can rule out no, they don't have any of these, then you feel pretty safe. And also, to me, I feel pretty safe, too, that they might have migraine if they have that family history. Because if mama had headaches, that's really good. That's reassuring. You want mama to have had headaches. Or, so rule out um, fever, weight loss, um, uh, if they have HIV or cancer, they could have a lesion you'd want to investigate further. And then um, do um, a neurologic exam. That's fun. Sometimes we have teenagers or young children that come to us and we're doing the reflex hammer and the neuro exam and doing all sorts of things. And they're like, that's so funny. Why are you doing all that clown stuff? And I'm like, well, you, were, you went to a neurologist. They must have done that at the neurologist. Nope. Yeah. So you really need to get the exam. The fundoscopic exam is the most important to make sure that they don't have papilledema. And then your 12 cranial nerves and reflexes. Um, if somebody has never had a headache before, not more than one or two mild headaches in their life, and all of a sudden they're having a new headache problem greater than 50, you want to rule out some things, okay? It used to be greater than 50. I think the new um, criteria is I get nervous greater than 40. So if you've never had a history of headaches and all of a sudden you're 42 years old and you're having headaches every day, that is not normal. So I'd want to rule out some bad stuff. And then... Um, the previous headache history, is it progressive? Is the pattern changing? Postural, you've got CSF leaks. We're going to, so um, Reed Moore is going to talk about high pressure headaches, and then we also have somebody who's going to do low pressure headaches. So for the position and the postural, that can give you some ideas about maybe this daily headache is, is due to either a leak in the spine or um, increased pressure in the brain. But a lot of times, people don't even recognize that those symptoms are even there. Some people don't realize that, especially a lot of our leakers, we have about um, 35 to 40 leakers. They have no idea that it's positional. A lot of times they, they say, well, my first eight hours are the best eight hours of the day because when I get out of bed or before I open my eyes, I'm pretty much pain-free, but it gets worse and gradual throughout the day. So while they were standing up, it's getting worse throughout the day. So if somebody has a continuous headache, that they're never pain-free, those are, um, need to be investigated much further. And then precipitated by um, valsalva or exertion, so you're looking for a posterior fossil lesion. That's why you're getting an MRI and not a CT. And um, then uh, ringing in the ears, um, and we're going to go into in idiopathic intracranial hypertension and pregnancy. A lot of women will never have their headaches until they, they start having them in the pregnancy or after the birth of their first, second, or third child. So it's very typical, and it's a hormonal thing, and estrogen is involved. But bad things can happen to pregnant women, too, so we need to rule out these bad things and make sure that nothing's different or unusual. And then, okay. And this is about neuroimaging. Basically, this is the criteria from the American Headache Society, but it says do not order an MRI on everybody who has a headache. It says only order an MRI if you're suspicious of something. So avoid an, um, a scan if you can. So if they don't have a daily headache or if it fits all the criteria for something or they've had the same pattern where she has headaches with her cycle for 20 years, she probably doesn't have a brain tumor. So as long as they have some, some time where they're pain-free, you don't necessarily have to scan. And don't do a CT when MRI is available. A CT should only be used in the emergency department to rule out a bleed. Okay. And then this is also from the American College of Radiology saying the same exact thing. This choosingwisely.org site is really good. All right. And then this, I got this from the um, American College of Emergency Physicians. Is anybody in here from the ER, work in the ER or urgent care? 
All right, good. Um, I'm not going to go through these because I'm kind of late on time. And um, this is just uh, criteria of who would need um, a CT of the head. And then we've got lots of treatment options. <laughs> we've got the prevention on the left and <laughs> attacks up top. <laughs> Pick your flavor. Yeah, so um, most, people, most people who have migraine, that's what they're using. Um, but we have more specific drugs and better drugs that are targeting the pathophysiology of what is actually happening in migraine, and that's very exciting because I don't even know if they even called it migraine 50 years ago. You know, they had to come to a consensus on the terminology. So the science in migraine and headache is all very, very new with all these new scientific technologies we have to discover things. All right, Gen general principles of management. Uh, you want to get the diagnosis correct. I hope I've said that a thousand times. And then you want to tell them they have to keep a headache diary. Not everybody's good at that. I have a paper one at our office, but we also do an electronic one. They, there's um, my my pain diary and migraine buddy. There's a lot of different apps that they can have. So I say if they're older, like me, they probably like paper, and if they're younger and tech savvy, they probably like the iPad. I don't care which one they use as long as they use one. And I don't really need a whole um, journal entry about every single thing they did that day. I just want to know, did you have headache pain that day? Did you not? Did you have to treat it with the medication or not? So that's really key to see if they're getting into medication overuse headache and when they're treating. And then you, you want the plan to be individualized. <clears throat> Obviously, a lot of our patients that we diagnose with migraine, I want to give them an inset, a triptan, or a DHE product and a, an anti-emetic or neuroleptic drug because that combination works really well. But if they have a stomach um, history of GI um, problems or GI bleeds, I'm not going to give them the inset. So it has to be very generalized. I mean. Um, specific, individualized. Also, I might have a plan for somebody, and they might say, I, I'd say, I think we should try this medicine for your prevention. They say, oh, I'm not going to do that. So it's a partnership. If the patient's not going to do that, it's not going to work. So you, you basically have to talk about all the risk factors, what are the side effects of this drug, and what are the benefits of this drug, and you have to balance that and see what's going to work. And I, I, I know this is going to come as a surprise, but we don't always get it right on the first time. So. And then we want to, this is um, interesting to me that I didn't understand this actually until I started doing research and speaking on ad boards. I had a lot of patients who, tells, who would tell me that their rel packs made them better. And I'm like, that's great. So I was just writing down better. Better's good. Better's great. And then I, I started saying, so what does better mean to you? And you find out, well, better means I take the rel packs, I have to go lay down for six hours, and when I get up six hours later, it's gone. That's not effective acute treatment. So effective acute treatment is measured by speed of getting you pain-free and most bothersome symptom-free. So if, when they're studying these now, we want to look at the moment you take your attack medicine, are you pain-free at zero, not at a one or a two, but pain-free at zero, because we want to minimize the rebound effect and the central sensitization. Are you pain-free and are you not nauseated and you can fully function? So that's the goal of acute medicine is fast, rapid relief because the longer they stay in that sensitization, the worse it gets and the harder it is to treat. And um, another thing about um, the analgesic effect and, and the low recurrence rate, if we um, add a tr um, an NSAID, um, a lot of us like the powder form of diclofenac. If we add an NSAID, through Ramey Bernstein's work, we've, we've learned that adding an NSAID, NSAID to your um, attacks migraine-specific medication can decrease the risk of getting rebound and getting that recurrence. And also, if you go to the ER, um, you have a 25% less chance of rebound if you give them dexamethasone in the ER. So, and then... So these are some considerations. I think I've been all over these. Most, most migranors have what's called like a gradual attack where it starts out at one or two and over three or four hours it gets worse. That's typical. Um, people who have cluster, bam, it starts and it's like gone from zero to 200 in, within 10 minutes, okay? So the, the, the peak tens, t intensity is crucial, but there are people who have what we call crash migraines, where they just have a sudden onset of their migraine, and so they need more rapid, so they need a different deli delivery mechanism that's not an oral. So they'll need a nasal spray or a patch 
or an injection to treat those headaches. And um, people who wake up with their headaches, um, about a, a lot of migraineurs will say, I wake up with them. If they wake up with their headaches, they were sleeping during the prodrome and the aura phase, and so they missed it when it was five, six, seven, and so when they're waking up, it's already an eight. Okay, and they're already behind the ball on treatment. So a lot of times, wake up, back up, and throw up, that's when we want an injection so, to treat that headache. And then this is level of evidence, and <clears throat> so um, all that over-the-counter stuff has some level of evidence that it helps in migraine, but if, if it was still helping them, they wouldn't be coming to see us, correct? And it might be part of the harm that they're doing. And um, then prochlorperazine, that's compazine. That's one of my favorite drugs because that the, has the number one evidence IV that if you're in an urgent uh, care situation, you're having a headache that is not responding to any, anything, the number one thing you want to give them in the ER is prochlorperazine. Um, it has, and then the next one, if you don't give prochlorperazine, is Reglan. And some can tolerate one, not the other. I don't give a lot of Zofran because Zofran does help the nausea but has no evidence to help the headache. And I don't, it, it, there's no evidence that Finnegan helps the headache and it causes drowsiness. So our, our, our favorite ones are Composine and Reglan. And we do um, pre-treat with uh, Benadryl so they don't have the side effects. So that can make them a little bit drowsy. Um, and then a lot of people will use, um, please never use any more Fioracet. Um, everybody in here familiar with Fioracet, Fioranol, Esgic, Frenolin? So that was designed by Montefiore Hospital um, about 30 years ago. And they named it after the hospital. Uh, and it's called um, Fioracet, Fioranol. Now they actually put patients in hospital to get them off of that medication. So it's a very, it's never been FDA approved for migraine. So, and it has a barbiturate in it, and it, it can be very addictive. Um, and it, I actually have has had some patients who come in and say that they're taking six Fioracet a day. So, and you cannot stop that stuff cold turkey. So if they're on six a day, or 20 a day, you have to either taper them off slowly or um, put them on phenobarbital. And then, I'm gonna go into a little bit more of this later. Um, medication overuse headache, I think I've talked about this a lot. Um, triptans, NSAIDs, they have different risk. An NSAID may not have as much risk of being a medication overuse headache as, say, a triptan. But, so I just really ask them, how many times are you treating per week? And if it's two or more, even if it's just two, they're gonna be at risk of transforming from high frequency episodic migraine to chronic migraine. A lot of people don't intervene fast enough. Oh, she only has two headache days per, per week. I said, well, what if that changes next month and she's having three? And then the next month she's having four. So we need to intervene faster and, and do, do a better job. And we need to give them the education. So we give them, everybody who comes to our clinic has a medication overuse handout so they understand that, yes, we want you pain free, but we don't want to make the problem worse by um, keeping the old habits of staying in medication overuse. All right, and the MOTS trial, that is, um, we'll probably talk about this more when we talk about the clinical trials, but, oh, and this is really good, because we've got the East meets West over here. So, um, in, in, in Europe, in Denmark, when they notice that somebody has medication of overused headache, they just stop the offending drug. And they get better. And yeah, and so we're gonna talk to her about that. We've got a lot, a lot of Q&A, but we're too, soft over here, so we usually put them on prevention and give them another attack plan. And so we're looking at different treatment strategies. What's the best way? Should you put them on prevention and tell them to take nothing or put them on prevention and give them a different attack medicine from a different category or should you just stop it cold turkey and, and, and just hope things get better in a few weeks? But um, there's a lot of debate in this. All right. All right, so preventive therapy. Um, they have some guidelines. I think at one time the, the number was four. If you have four headaches per month, you qualify for prevention. In our clinic, if you have one day a month that you are calling in sick or not going to work or not going to school, one day a month where you have a headache that's so bad that your attack medicine is not good enough that it can't keep you from vomiting or having an aura 
or functioning at work, if you have one day of disability per month, we'll do prevention in our clinic. So we have a lower threshold for that. But um, we can treat some people who have only uh, one or two headaches per year, but they're so bad with their vomiting or their aura that they just need an injectable. And if they're treated well with that, they, they don't necessarily need prevention. But there's nutraceuticals you can start with for prevention too. Okay, this is more level of evidence. Um, and I'm excited because this is an old slide deck. So last year when we had this program, only one of these um, uh, monoclonal antibodies, you're gonna hear that a lot today, I think, one, only one of these monoclonal antibodies had gotten to market. Now we've got three that are out in the market, and those are the, the MABs over there. So for chronic migraine only, Botox, or onobotulinum toxin, is FDA approved, but you have to have a minimum of 15 headache days per month. The, uh, the three over there are the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, and there's, you don't have to have chronic migraine to use those. So you can use those um, if you have a good office manager who knows how to get approved with the PAs and everything. And actually, these drugs are right now, they're free for patients on, on their assistance program. So they're getting covered by a lot of the payers, and there's ways to get these drugs. So that's really nice. Before that, we had other drugs, but those other drugs were developed for other things. They were developed for seizures or antidepressants or um, beta blockers were developed for um, hypertension. So we were using borrowed medicine before. We were using something that, oh, it kind of happens to work for headache too in some people. So um, we'll go into, uh, propranolol is my favorite of the beta blockers, but a, a lot of times if we've got women that are healthy and thin and their blood pressure is already low, we can't necessarily put them on a beta blocker. And um, also pandasartan and lisinopril have some evidence, and a lot of my colleagues use those as well. We do put them on blood pressure medicine in our clinic because we want to make sure that they have a normotensive blood pressure, A, to keep them safe and alive, but so that we can also give them triptans and DHE and, and NSAIDs as well. And um, a lot of people will use gabapentin for headaches. This means it, gabapentin should never, ever, ever be used first line for headache disorder. There's um, adjunctively, we might use it if they have some neck pain, but we never use that as a first line or a, a monotherapy for um, migraine prevention. Lamotrigine, <clears throat> which is lamictal, it has some evidence in prolonged aura, only in that. So prolonged aura. So you've got somebody who has a aura, symptoms that last like a week, you might try lamotrigine. All right, and I've already told you about this. So I'm going to, I don't know where these are, but I, I made this. So this is, a, um, we wanted people who were um, three hours away in Delta, Mississippi, if it was midnight on a Sunday, to have something that, got them better treatment in the ER. So they can take this with them to the ER, and the, guess what it says? It says, this is how you confirm that I have migraine on this side. This is how you rule out the bad stuff, because they might not trust you. And then this, on this side, it says, what is the best treatment for acute um, management of um, status migranosis? And the cool thing, it says, don't give me any narcotics. And if you come in, if you bring that into the ER, they're gonna get better treatment, because they're gonna realize that if, if I have a card saying, don't give me narcotics, I'm not a drug seeker. And if, you're, if they know that you're not a drug seeker, they're going to treat you better. So um, this is helpful. These are actually, you can purchase these. We'll have these for sale um, for 20 bucks. They cost, I have it on hard, like hard, like plastic, so that they can't destroy it. And um, $10 goes towards the, the cost of this. The other $10 goes towards our nonprofit. And the, um, Education. We actually mailed this to every single ER in the state of Mississippi. I didn't get one thank you. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, all these drugs are good. I could, I could, my next talk next year will be on uh, treating in urgent care and the ER because it's one of my favorite subjects. But I'm, I'm running over time. Dexamethasone should never be used first line in the ER to treat a headache. It only prevents recurrence, and it only has a 25% chance of preventing recurrence. And normal saline and diphenhydramine, there's no evidence that either of these actually help headache, but they're good because when somebody goes to the ER, you want IV access, and you want fluids. They're probably dehydrated, and you want to do a combination of medications. Okay, okay procedures. We're going to do a lot of procedures later on. I'm not going to talk about this. The good thing is what we tell our patients is if you can't get rid of that headache in two days, 
call us, please. Don't wait until it's been two weeks. And we can get you in that day or the next day for nerve blocks or IV infusions. Right, Heather? <laughs> so, yeah, Heather's been doing a lot of those. <clears throat> Heather McCoy, she's the um, president <clears throat> of our nonprofit foundation. And um, she has a headache center in Scottsdale, Arizona. And she's really, really busy right now doing a lot of IV infusions and nerve blocks. And all her patients are just saying, this is heaven, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the Raskin protocol, this is DHE. Um, this is um, Peter Goadsby's. He said, who is Raskin? So um, DHE, the number one um, side effect is going to be nausea. So you do want to pre-treat with some Reglan. And we don't give narcotics with this. But um, we actually have uh, a neurology practice here in town, um, St. Dominic. So if I have a patient who I think needs DHE, a week of DHE, we just admit them to the hospital from Monday through Friday, and they get the DHE and the anti-emetic and the Toradol um, for five days, and it's planned. Okay? And a lot of times that can get people out of rebound, and it can get people out of um, status migranosis as well. So. And then... Um, these are some places, so we're a headache specialty center in Mississippi, but if we're working with a patient that we cannot move the needle and get them any better, if we cannot, if we've worked with them for six months and their chart's this big and we've tried everything and we've, we've re-diagnosed them a hundred times, if we can't get you better, and I know you're a compliant patient who's really trying to get better, then I'll refer, um, I can get patients into Diamond Headache Center within two weeks. Now, I like Diamond Headache Center not so much because of their method of treatment, but when you're, you're, you're in, in the Diamond Headache Center, they let you wear plain clothes, and you're on a floor of, there's um, 42 beds, and everybody there has chronic headaches. And so they do a lot of the biobehavioral stuff there. So when they're not on their IV medications, they're learning about, um, they're, they're learning about their disorders, they're having pharmacology classes, they're doing yoga, they're doing <coughs> mindful meditation, and they're doing biofeedback. So that teaches you a lot of coping skills that's hard to teach when you're not inpatient. And y'all have that in the Danish Headache Center, correct? But they've got some fancy biofeedback machine. I can't wait to see it. Um, Jefferson will only take patients that are over 18. I tried to get somebody into Jefferson, but they can have the 18 and over rule. Diamond will see younger children. Um, and then there's Monte Fiore. I talked about that in the Fiore set. And, um, and a headache specialist can be a neurologist. And a neurologist can be a headache specialist, but every neurologist is not a headache specialist. And a lot of our headache specialists are ER medicine trained, internal medicine trained, uh, family medicine doctors who just found a love for migraine or headache disorders. So um, if you look at the National Headache Foundation, most everybody on their board member is not a neurologist. So a lot of times say, well, we'll just send them to neurology, they'll get better. If that neurologist does not love migraine and have a passion for it and go to conferences all the time and read all the books and keep up on the literature, they're not going to be good at treating that. All right. And um, so these are some treatment options. I believe lasmetidan just came out this week. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. And it was Raval. Did I say that right? So lasmetidan is a new um, drug for um, acute attack of migraine, and it's called, it's in the ditans, I must spell that wrong. So it's one of the ditans. And then the zomotriptan patch, that came out, that's not on the market anymore. But there is um, some, uh, there's an inhaled nasal DHE that's coming out. There's a new nasal um, sumatriptan that came out, correct? Tosimra. Um, and uh, the G-Pants, um, G pants are not out yet, but they have um, gone through clinical trials. And what I'm talking about is you're going to hear a lot about CGRP. And CGRP is a monoclonal antibody that they had to um, find a way to inject it into the body so it could attack one of those inflammatory mediators, okay? But when they first st started fighting CGRP, what they found out was, yes, it was very efficacious, but when they did the studies in humans, they found that there might be a signal of some liver toxicity. So they halted everything. So they've got other G pants where they're studying them both for prevention and attack that are daily oral medications um, that you can take for prevention or attack. And these do not have a signal of, of um, liver toxicity. They measure their labs every single month. They make sure there's highs laws. There's a lot of legal stuff involved to make sure that these people are safe. 
but when they realized that, they, that we weren't going to have CGRP, they said it was very effective in fighting um, the, this migraine cascade, they said we have to do it a different way. So they looked into other treatments and they found out in other fields like um, MS and, and autoimmune disorders that they had the MABs, which are monoclonal antibodies. And so basically a monoclonal antibody is basically um, it's a protein. And the good thing about this is it's not, it has to be injected. And, um, and when the way we eliminate it, it's just amino acids that get broken up and eaten by, absorbed through your body. So it's not going through your liver or your kidneys. So the good thing is they have a lot less side effects. So if you looked up Topamax or Propranolol or anything that we use for prevention, um, Elevil, Amitriptyline, you know, they, they, they can be good if you can tolerate them. So we're trying to have better drugs that can be good and more tolerable. Um, a lot of people who take a triptan will say, you know, it feels like I'm having a heart attack. And they'll say they're allergic. They're not allergic. That's just a triptan reaction. So, and, um, all right. I have um, somebody who's going to do a whole PowerPoint on this. This is neuromodulation. So when we take a pill or something that we're trying to shut off the cascade of migraine, we're trying to basically neuromodulate, okay? And they have devices that have certain frequencies and do certain things to send signals to your brain, to your brain stem, to say, stop getting into this pain cycle. So it's really cool. But there's three, three or four different ones, and Heather's going to speak on that. And um, these are, I like people to get sources that are good sources and reputable. Um, these are reputable sources for um, getting good information. Headache on the Hill is a, and um, Cluster Busters. Cluster Busters is actually going to be here. Ashley Haddle's going to set up a booth. Does anybody know what Cluster Busters is? Okay, it's really cool. So um, Cluster Headache, you're going to learn about it, is the worst pain known to man. It's 10 times worse than natural childbirth and kidney stones put together, okay? So they had to put together a patient organization support group um, because it's, it's kind of so rare that they weren't getting right treatment. It was taking like 16 years to get the diagnosis, okay? So, and Ashley tells me that, that when they started Cluster Busters, they had nine in Cluster Busters, nine at their first meeting. So. This is a support group that works towards research and advocacy and trying to get you know, our government to give more dollars to headache research as well. But um, Cluster is um, really interesting, and I think we're going to show some Cluster episodes if anybody can tolerate, tolerate it later on today. And that's all. Any questions?